I'm, I'm so glad that you all came. Uh, it's really a pleasure to, to come uh, speak uh, to you at NBCR. I remember I was a camper at this, uh, at this particular workshop uh, several years ago, and it was a good time. And, uh, but anyway, today I'm going to talk to you about these two tools, uh, FTMAP and FTPROD. So I, I didn't realize this, but I guess Rob already talked a little bit about FTMAP or had you guys sort of, sort of, oh, oh, okay, okay, great. Well, then, uh, then, then I guess I don't need to, um, I, I guess I, I, I don't need to skim over that too much then. But uh, anyway, my name is Lane, so please feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have any questions. And so what, what exactly we're trying to accomplish with, with these programs is, uh, is, what I, is what I would call, I guess what we call hotspot identification. And what we mean by a hotspot is that on the surface of a biomolecule, there are regions that uh, probably touch, that would, that would be touching something that would say bind to that biomolecule or bind to that protein, whether that's a drug or, uh, or it, maybe it's an interface to, to form a, a dimer or a trimer, or maybe it's an allosteric site, something like that. And so these, these hot spots contribute disproportionately to the free energy of binding uh, between the biomolecule you're interested in and whatever is the substrate that we're talking about. And so finding these hot spots have all sorts of useful possibilities. Uh, I mentioned some drug discovery, um, maybe finding allosteric sites. Uh, that sort of thing. Anytime you have a biomolecule interacting with something else, a uh, hotspot may be involved. So there are all sorts of various methods, both experimental and computational, to find these hotspots. And first, I just want to talk about this experimental method as a background, um, uh, solvent fragment mapping, where uh, you can imagine that what they might take is they might take a large number of these small molecular solvent probes, you'd call them. So like maybe something like benzene or methanol, a number of them that would represent the chemical space of the functional groups you'd likely see binding in a biomolecular environment. And so uh, where these bind, or if you can find a way to determine where these are sort of congregating or where these are hanging out uh, on the surface of the biomolecule, then that might indicate where the hot spots are. And, uh, and oftentimes, the, this technique is used for drug discovery uh, efforts because, uh, because where maybe, maybe where, a, a, say, a benzene might attach to the surface, that's where you might have sort of a, you know, like a, a phenol ring in, on a drug molecule or something like that. It can help, it can help guide drug design. Uh, and one of these, one of these methods is, uh, is called MSCS, which stands for Multiple Solvent Crystal Structures. And actually what they do is they'll, they'll uh, dissolve these probes, these small molecules, in a certain concentration, and then crystallize the protein, and then resolve the, the structures using x-ray crystallography. And, they'll, and then they, they, you can, they can actually visualize where these probes have bound on the surface of the biomolecule. Um, so some of, the, some of the organic solvents they might use, like I said before, maybe methanol, benzene, urea. And uh, that gives a character to what sort of functional group might bind to that spot in the protein. And this schematic sort of portrays what, uh, what the process is, is you, you have your biomolecule and you dissolve it with one of your probes. And then you, when you resolve it, you actually see where the probes go on the surface. And then that sort of tells you, that, that gives you uh, a hint about its about its uh, binding characteristics. Yes, question. How do so, uh, The question is how, how they would choose the probes. Um, I think uh, the, what you, what you, what they, I don't know if, if there's necessarily uh, like a, um, a procedure that you would go about in order to find these probes or to find these probes, but probably you would want to choose something that's drug-like. You'd, you'd want to choose a, a probe that has chemical features similar to what a drug molecule would have or what, whatever the binder is, is you're interested in. So like phenyl rings or, or polar groups and, uh, you know, like, I don't know, I guess aldehydes, that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's right. Well, yeah, you you do see the electron density, but then you then you what you what I guess uh, what we would see um, is we'd see a PDB file of the protein with these small molecules 
sort of stuck in various places around the protein. You can resolve. It, hopefully, you can. Um, you'd want to be able to. And uh, this, yeah. So this is a this is an experimental method. It's uh, it's something you do with test tubes and with uh, and with um, and in wet labs and that sort of thing. And so so actually, what what we're going to be talking about is a tool that tries to accomplish the same thing computationally, um, because crystal structures are very, as you as you may know, are very expensive to obtain. Anywhere from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars per structure, uh, if I understand correctly. Um, and so, uh, so if we can find a way to do it effectively computationally, then then that would be uh, that would be very advantageous. Um, so, and, and I guess I, I hopefully it's clear that that uh, the type of probe that binds to the surface would tell you what type of functional group might bind well to that part of the surface. So then I'll introduce FT Map, which is a which is a tool that uh, was made at Boston University that attempts to perform this task computationally. It mimics this MSCS method. Uh, and uh, the reason it's called FTMAP is because it uses a Fourier transform uh, in, uh, by, um, by sort of docking, if you will. It, it docks these, these small molecular probes to the surface of the protein. It samples all these different conformations. It uses, it's a very complicated algorithm. It uses, uh, uh, it uses sort of a simplified potential energy function, and it, and it evaluates. Uh, Many, many different uh, uh, different conformations of these small molecules, and I actually have a bit of an outline here in a minute about how uh, just just very very simply how it works. And there's 16 different probe types, and I have that on uh, I have that I have a list of what which, which ones those are here uh, coming up pretty soon. But it uh, the the point uh, that I want to get across is it just analyzes one single crystal structure at or uh, so what you would do is you'd pull off a crystal structure from the PDB put it into this program, and then it would return back your crystal structure with the probes docked into various locations based on what the algorithm computes. And so it just provides one structure at a time. And these are the probes that it uses. Uh, you can see methanol up there, ethanol, isopropyl alcohol, et cetera. And uh, I'll, actually, uh, I'll actually have you guys try out this. It's a web service. And you just, you just give it a PDB file or a PDB code. And uh, it samples billions of different possible conformations for these small molecules, just like a docking algorithm. And then it chooses the 2,000 best ones and uh, then uses the charm potential to sort of minimize their locations and orientations. And then it clusters them once. And then it takes the centroids of those and it clusters it again. So, it's a, so it's, it's, it's a, it, like I said, it's, it's kind of a complicated sort of contrived um, algorithm, but it seems to work very well for reproducing the experimental MSCS, as I'll show here in a moment. Um, and the, these clumps of probes that you get are, are just called consensus sites. That's what they call it. It's like another word for the hot spot that I was talking about earlier. Whoops. Um, so they, they validated this against a, a protein called porcine pancreatic elastase. And if you look here, up on the top, You've got what the experimental, the actual, uh, the actual resolved crystal structures yield using this experimental technique, and uh, it's very similar to what they get using the computational server, but um, presumably at much faster and much less cost. Uh, see, you kind of, you kind of recreate these four uh, different hot spots here, also down there, and you also get an idea for the chemical characteristics of the types of probes that bind to it, like, like you can see. Uh, in this spot, I think I see a couple polar groups, maybe uh, maybe some hydrophobic things. Um, it also correctly predicts the the S1 pocket. Uh, they also try it out. Oh, and I guess on this slide, they're talking about they actually sort of quali quantitatively compare uh, the number of interactions, like non-bonded interactions and hydrogen bond interactions between the two, in these in these uh, slides here or in these figures. Then they also try it against renin. Uh, and uh, each of these figures sort of depicts the, you've, you've got uh, the, there, there's two inhibitors here. There's sort of a uh, peptidomimetic inhibitor, and then there's also a drug molecule. And uh, here they ran FTMAP on the crystal structure that had the drug molecule resolved in it. Then they removed the drug molecule and then tried out FTMAP in it. And you can see that the probes sort of like almost, they, they pretty well recreate the shape of the drug molecule on the inside of the pocket. This, this figure right down here is 
where they just took the APO structure, the APO crystal structure, and they ran FTMAP on it. It's sort of, you know, you're sort of recapturing some of these chemical characteristics. And then this last one here was they took, they took a crystal structure of renin with the peptidomimetic inhibitor inside it. They removed that and then ran FTMAP on it. So it, it seems to recreate these hot spots fairly well. Whether you use APO or whether, um, uh, you probably would prefer to use a holo crystal structure that you've pulled the, the uh, molecule out of. But uh, um, it's, it seems like for a typical protein, it's, it, so it's, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, it's a web server uh, running on the Boston University campus. And so you, there's like a queue and everything. But it, it seems like it takes maybe about an hour per structure, in my experience, um, give or take. So where we come in is that, uh, as I mentioned before, FTMAP only considers one structure at a time. But of course, proteins aren't like that. Proteins are constantly changing. They don't function at zero Kelvin. Uh, they're, they're breathing, they're moving, they're, they're, uh, they're twisting and, uh, and drifting and tumbling. And so uh, uh, if we want to try to include some of that information, and also they don't just, they don't just move uh, on the, uh, they, don't, they don't just uh, uh, move on, uh, I guess, what we would call like biologic, or uh, I guess what you'd call like the millisecond scale. They also mutate, they mutate as, uh, across maybe different organisms, and maybe you want to compare how the hotspots differ between different mutants of the biomolecule. Um, and so that's, uh, that's why we developed, uh, and here I just have a few examples. Yeah, so you might have multiple structures from, uh, from several different crystal structures. You might have MD simulation snapshots. You might have an NMR ensemble, something like that. And if you want to compare multiple structures uh, all at the same time, we developed FTProd to do that. And it uses the output from FTMAP, and it sort of combines them together in a way that allows you to see how these sites are changing across these different structures. Um, and here, if, if anyone's interested, here are the two publications that talk about that particular tool. For example, we, we ran this on neuraminidase. And this is the sialic acid binding site of neuraminidase. And here we have three different mutants of neuraminidase. Here we've got a 2004 H5N1. Here we've got the 2009 swine flu. I don't know if you guys remember that from six years ago. Uh, and then here's an H3N2. And notice that uh, the binding site, uh, it changes slightly between these different mutants. And FTProd allows you to easily see how it's changing. Uh, and it's also showing like sort of the ideal locations to place maybe like a, a benzene ring, something like that. And then down here we have a different pocket. I think this is the 150 pocket. Uh, it's showing how the site itself is changing. And FTProd allows you to do that perhaps more easily than you would if you actually went in and just did it all manually by hand. So could, you, could you just summarize the difference between FTMAP and FTProd? Sure. FTMAP is, is a web server that you put the crystal structure into. It returns your crystal structure back with the probes docked into it. Okay. And, I, and, I'll, and, I, and it'll be clear once I show a slide coming up pretty soon. It's sort of as a schematic of how it all works. But then FTProd takes several inputs from FTMAP, brings them all together, and then gives you multi-structural information okay. that spans them all. Or maybe it's only unique to one, one of the structures, something like that. Or maybe, it's, uh, um, maybe something's changing. Maybe something is... Uh, is only present in one of the structures or in many of them. So that's what FTProd does. And, and actually, here it is. Um, you might, this, this is an example of what, how you might use FTMAP and FTProd. You might have a large number of frames from some simulation. Uh, you might cluster them because uh, at this time, FTMAP and FTProd are relatively slow, so it takes a long time to run a single frame through. So you may want to limit yourself to probably less than 100 preferably maybe even down to like only a dozen or so. So you might perform RMSD clustering in order to get a span of the uh, conformational space. And so you're, you're uh, brought down to fewer numbers of frames. You run each of them through the FTMAP server. And then you bring them all together, put them into FTProd, and then FTProd gives you information about these different hotspots that span the multiple structures. And uh, I mean, so far, uh, they're not sort of clumped into one. Like you have to do, you have to do two separate steps. You have to run FTMAP first, and then you have to run FTProd. But if there's enough interest, then I then and and if and if people are using it enough, then I might someday 
sort of combine the two into one so that it's, it's one simple step. So this is how, how FTProd works, sort of like in, I guess, a, um, I guess uh, just uh, conceptually. You might have multiple structures. FTMap finds the hot spots in these multiple structures. And then FTProd brings them all together and overlays them. And then it assigns them, and then it clusters them together. So even though these two blue ones were separate consensus sites according to FTMap, FTProd says, oh, these must be the same thing. Or these two yellow ones, right? And then it brings them all back apart again, and you can compare them. See how the hotspots are changing. And this is accompanied with a graphical user interface in VMD. So it's a VMD plugin. OK, so then I guess uh, uh, we, can, we can begin the, the hands-on workshop. Uh, but I, I definitely want to take any questions. And then we'll probably take a break to help anyone install VMD who needs to. Yes, I think there was a question over here. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, the question was: Is, is uh, if you, um, if, if uh, FTMap is assigning different types of molecules to different locations, like uh, like uh, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, polar, uh, charged, then does it keep the ar aromatic, aliphatic, et cetera? Does it keep that information? And the answer is yes, it does. And you can actually sort the sites based on this information in FTProd. Any other questions? So you also mentioned about from different species, there might be like subtle differences, some mutations in the binding pocket. Mm -hmm. So let's say this structure is from one species and we map it. And then there is another structure. It is slightly different and we map it. It has some mutation. So FT plot would combine this. Uh, like how can we see the differences, subtle differences? The, the question is, is, is if you've got differences between two structures, whether they're by mutation or some other reason, if there's a difference between them, will FTProd allow you to see the differences? And the answer is, is that, is that there's sort of, a, there's sort of a, a sensitivity slider, if you will. It's, you can slide the sensitivity of, of uh, whether or not they will cluster two groups together. So if you slide it all the way to the right, then maybe it'll just put everything into the same site. But if you slide it all the way to the left, then everything's going to be separated out. So it's, what it, I'll tell you right now that FTMap and FTProd are, they're not very quantitative tools. They're very qualitative tools. They're designed to give you an intuition, an, an, uh, an intuition into what's going on. It's not, like, it's not like it's giving you a number that you can you know, put into like a, you know, like a statistical mechanical formula or something. It's just designed to, to help your intuition. And so it's, it's going to be sort of an art to, to shift all of these different options to, get, uh, to sort of get what you're looking for. And then uh, there was a question over there. Yes. Yeah, so I, I was using FTMap, and I noticed that when you look at the job details, there's a difference between the user input PDB and then there's the sort of process PDB. Do you know, I guess, how they process the new input, or if they minimize that structure at all, or what they're doing? I really, I, I, I'm pretty sure they don't. OK, so the question was, is, is in FTMap, she's noticing a difference between whether you enter your own structure or whether you give it the PDB ID. And, and that's a good question. I'm sorry? That, that wasn't, it oh. wasn't, I had uploaded each time. OK. So um, like there were 20 snapshots from, from the PDB, from the NMR PDB. So the, I had uploaded the file each time. Um, but it seems when you look at the job details, there's two Uh. So they all kind of were processed in a very similar structure. And it changed between like what I, the user input and the process input. But I was reading hmm. through the references and I couldn't find anything about them minimizing the PDB structures before they did the mapping. I didn't know if you That's really strange. She's noticing differences between, uh, be between uh, user input and process input. I'm not really sure what's causing that. I, I don't, I'm not a developer on FT map, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly how their server's handling these things, but I, I don't think that the biomolecular structure itself is minimized. I know that the probes will change location, uh, and they'll be assigned a different place. But I can't imagine that they would actually change the structure of the biomolecule itself, like the protein. Maybe addition yeah. of like hydrogen. 
Maybe. Also, yeah, that could be it. Also, I know that you can choose like which chain IDs are included in the calculation. I wonder if that's somehow affecting it. Like, like when you when you uh, when you enter in the structure, you can define which chains it actually even considers in the calculation. 